Hello guys and welcome back to the channel. So this is part four of the interview series that I have done with Coastrap and in this episode we're going to speak about how Palantir could kill all its competitors with one single step. They could bring about the existence of SaaS 2.0 and we're going to talk about what data apps are and what is holding Palantir back. It's a fantastic episode. It really has a ton of value and as always if you like this content please make sure you hit the subscribe button. And if you want to go further, check out the Patreon link, which is the first link in the description box below, where you can support me, help Europeans survive the winter for five bucks a month. I'm not going to talk more. Let's get into this fantastic episode. Thank you, Codestrap. I link his channel in the description box below. Enjoy. And here's a question that I've been meaning to ask since I've heard about this data apps. So yep. let's say we're a big company. We do this digital transformation. We have Palantir Foundry. So let's say that it's like nike we have developed our internal programs to you know handle supply chains handle customers you know how they supply the the shops and they you know how to forecast like okay this country is going to order like europe is going to order during christmas time you know asia is going to order a lot some other time and yep. then as, as far as i understand on the data apps if you were really smart you would rewrite these programs on top of foundry so you wouldn't yep. use like an yeah and my question is who is re, is it like is it possible that we will have a whole industry built on foundry with you know yes that's the skateboarding that's yeah. skateboarding that's what i'm talking about that's what you're blocking yeah. the creation of that could be a multi-trillion dollar mistake by not opening the platform yeah because yeah. They, they would also be selling you right like you would come up oh. let's say I come That's up the with... immediate second order consequence of not opening the fucking platform. Like I've been saying for a while, they should have a business development division that goes around to every SaaS company, partners with them, gives them their software for free, just so they will rebuild their SaaS offering on top of Foundry, right? Like that would be a smart business decision because then all of your gazillion dollar enterprise clients can now do what we were talking about, which is SaaS 2.0 with all the products yeah. they're already fucking using. <laughs> You know, it's like, why are you not doing this? Like, don't try to make money off these companies. Just give them the goddamn software. Let them rebuild it and train them on this platform. And you know who's doing that? Snowflake. Snowflake is fucking doing that. They went around. They built a marketplace. Databricks is also doing that. They're building marketplaces. They're going out and partnering with these companies who, who build software and data to rebuild it on their platform and offer it through their marketplace. That's the third order consequence I was talking about. You can yeah, see it playing out in real time. You're blocking the creation of skateboarding which is the, the new SaaS 2.0 marketplace because you're not giving the product out there and training people on it. And the third order consequence is that your competitors will, you know. Okay, okay. Wow, this is also very, very interesting because this is what I wanted to ask sort of like, so if I understand it correctly, Snowflake is not a holistic solution, but because they're opening up the marketplace and, you know, yeah. they're opening themselves up, they are becoming sort of, holistic solution even though yep. they're, not they're over their skis so like let's go over how snowflake strategy could blow up in their face like yeah. one they, they don't have a true application platform you cannot rebuild SaaS on their platform yet you can build dashboards you can sell data sets but you cannot build a functional application like skywise or hyper auto right yeah. that are like groundbreaking or and you couldn't build a product like amplitude or google analytics on on these tools yet they're just not nowhere near there yet so that's they, they huge, can't even, huge yeah, minus. it's a yeah. huge, like, a, a, and, and they're going to get there eventually. It's a multi-year journey for them. They're at least five years out from being able to, to do anything. It, like is that, that. the one that Carp yeah. always references that it would be 10 years to build? Yeah. He always says and that's what I always yeah. reference. Like, I, I actually believe that, you know, but like, yeah. that's okay because in five years they can copy the most valuable pieces of your platform, you know? So like, dude, you can't, you can't sleep on that, man. Like, like it, because in year three, you're fucked. You know, so it's like it don't think of it as a 10 year time horizon and everything in technology is nonlinear. Like Carp always likes to point out, it's not like it's going to be this like slow linear growth of how yeah, they yeah. kill you. It's going to be like year three, you're done. You know, that's how yeah, that shit plays yeah. out typically. And like um, but the, the problems with Snowflake is that one, they, they don't even really have they, they just now released hybrid tables, which is like transactions on individual rows of data. And that's required to even build software on anything. You need that, that ability to have transactional support. And then that transactional database, that transactional table is then copied over to these column R tables for data analytics. They, they just released that. I mean, that's like a foundational piece. That's been in Foundry forever. Like Foundry supports transactions. Foundry supports um, column R analytics. Like that, that's been there forever. And then Foundry has this whole other system, the ontology API, which is like something they haven't even considered yet that they're going to need for, for distributed search. So like 
one of the biggest problems when you start building apps on top of the data is really what you need is a good domain model of your business to build good software. And there's a lot of reasons that you have to be able to do that. Not the least of which is you need data to interoperate between all of your screens and all of your, you know, pieces of software. You don't want to talk about that data differently at every point in those software pieces. And that's often what happens is because the engineers will build like a database that just represents their, their piece of software and not the business, not the domain. Nothing like that exists in Snowflake or Databricks. You, you, maybe you could try and cobble something together, but nothing like that exists. And it's unique in Foundry in that the ontology is not only a state, it's not only the representation of the data, it has behaviors. You can do stuff with the data. You can yeah, change yeah. it, or you can trigger alerts, or you can call other APIs, or you can, you know, as if you do something over here in the ontology, it can trigger right back into your ERP system to order parts, right? Like that's, they're so far ahead, right? Like in all of these areas that are absolutely required to get to the, the place we're talking about, which is rebuild SaaS on top of the, the data warehouse, which is all the more maddening because they could put these companies out of business with just one announcement, like Amplitude is building their software on top of Foundry. If that was announced, it would send shockwaves through the fucking industry because uh, they go, holy I, I totally shit. Yeah. yeah. I think it's yeah. coming. I, I think it will. I, I, I think so I, too. I, yeah. I get this sense. I don't have I any get... access to any information to make me believe that other than just what I'm like intuitively trying to push, yeah. put together. You know? Yeah, because, because, you know, like when I listen to Carp interviews, he always says that, you know, this company is not built for Wall Street and he's kind of a jackass to investors. Like he's sort of like, we are amazing and you either see it and, you know, you dig into the data and you find it out for yourself or go invest in another. That's kind of his viewpoint, you know? He's and, absolutely and I, right about that. I mean, he, he's got the the track record and the organization to back all of that. I, I don't think he's, yeah, I mean, he's, I, I would probably be that, feel that way too, having built that company. I and mean, think about what he, this guy has done. He built that company from the ground up. They have the best engineers in the world. They have the best software engineering culture that I've ever seen. Like, and he's, he's been leading that, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think he's got a lot of legs to stand on there. It doesn't make the message any more palatable, you know? But, no, yeah. but but I mean that it might be that they're working on it. It's just they. It's like in his mind, it's like yeah, we we will announce it when it's ready, and we don't give a fuck about investors knowing that it's coming. Or I I even That's got really this sense. dangerous though. Like I mean, there's just even um, the look look. I I even in one interview yeah. he he said that it's um it's so bad that we get bad press, and uh, like it's good exactly. for the company that they get bad press. Because then the competitors never find out how well they are doing, you know. So I, I really get this. Peter it's not Thiel. though. It, it you know the again you got to go. What are the second and third order consequences of a decision yeah, like that? Yeah. You know, and the yeah. competition absolutely gets a vote. You know, so like yeah, yeah. If 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 you take that stance right and you alienate investment, like so what 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 is the likelihood that an institution A over here is not going to buy it just because they heard your CEO say something they didn't like? You know. Stock could be awesome. Company could be awesome. Future could be yeah, awesome. Yeah, I mean, look, Musk I, I mean, there are there are second and third order consequences of those decisions. What about the third order consequences that because of you're not getting good press, you're only getting bad press, and the only reason you're getting bad press is because there's a lack of publicly available information because no one uses your software or even wants to talk about the fact they're using your software because of the bad press that um, you lose the NHS deal. You know? Yeah, like, yeah, what, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are the second and third order consequences of making decisions like this. You can't. You don't operate in a vacuum and the market will make you pay if you piss it off, you know? Like, yeah, and, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it is, it is who he is. So, okay. Yeah. So if, if, and I, I love Carp, by the way, like I don't ever want to see another CEO at Palantir. I love no, Alex me Carp. neither. Yeah. Me neither. Yeah. He's the right, he's the only person that can run that company in my opinion. Now, that doesn't mean I don't want to see commercial split off. I think commercial should split off. Um, I think that Sean maybe would be the right person to run commercial. He certainly has the, what he, from his public statements have, he's, he said like, we want to be the next AWS, you know, maybe he's the next Andy Jassy. I don't know, but like, yeah, it, it yeah. would be pretty cool to see what they could do by splitting commercial off. And people think that that means two but when separate. you, when you say splitting, do you mean that yeah. to make it like into two companies or this that... is a good parallel for Figma in Adobe right now, right? Yeah, so like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Adobe couldn't solve its enterprise sales problem. So they decided to buy Figma, right? Yeah, and yeah. they got they absolutely need to let Figma run as Figma and its own business model, right? Where with their own CEO and their own executive team making their own decisions with their own money, right? Without this team over here cannibalizing their business, which we all believe is going to happen in a couple of years. You know, once all the shares vest and you know all this shit happens, they probably will cannibalize that business and make it just a widget in their other offerings, you know. 
But that's what I'm talking about is to give Foundry Commercial its own CEO, its own executive team, its own funding to make its own decisions, including its go-to-market strategy. And, and it can be under the same company. It's just like Amazon Web Services is still part of one stock, one company. But yeah. It has its own executive team, its own leadership team, and is not cannibalized by the bookstore, you know. And that's that's the separation you want in between commercial and government, in my opinion, because these discussions that happen around um, do we want to handpick our customers? And maybe Kep Palantir has a town hall meeting about a use case for Foundry. Like, dude, you cannot grow a SaaS company at town hall meetings and you're, you're going to vet every customer that comes in or vet every use case. You create terms yeah, of right. service, right? Create a fucking terms of service, make people sign it and kick people off who violate it. But like their culture is very much wrapped around this other way of operating, much like Adobe's culture was wrapped around enterprise offerings and the enterprise model, which it's completely blocked them from this new way of building software and offering it in bottom up uh, SaaS. That's what you need. You need that kind of a separation. You know, you need to separate those two things. And I've, I've also said that they need to separate solutions from from their core product, which I think on a technical level they've done. But solutions, in my opinion, is better done through channel partners and you when know, when like, you say solutions, you mean that yeah. they're handling specific pro like let's say you have a problem with X and then they have a like not a holistic product, but just a solution for yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have like I need a custom built thing that you know, custom yeah. built feature on top of your platform to solve to yeah. make it work, make your core product work in a way that better suits my business. That's solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Amazon has solutions, but like you've seen companies recently like IBM, Jettison, their consulting sides, and that that's all solutions, right? Because they have very different concerns and when you're trying to build a technology company from the ground up like the last thing you want in my opinion is solutions bogging down your core product development and why do i say it bogs it down because you're always getting the solutions team coming to the core product team with different use cases asking them to like maybe change something or tweak something or maybe they're taking the core product and building on top of it creating future problems for the business like you don't want that hindering your broader platform adoption and that's where the real growth is you know solutions is going to be limited growth Yes, there's good money in it if you do it right. But again, I always felt like separate solutions from the fucking core product. Maybe give that to channel partners. Like you, you AWS has a thriving network of channel partners that build solutions, you know, custom one offs for, for every company under the sun. They go around, they do consulting. There's a thriving, probably multi billion dollar industry just in that, you know. Yeah, so. I can totally see it because those partners would be selling you like, exactly yeah i mean like it's debatable they, they, there are a lot of debates about how effective channel partners could be so they, they might sell you if you're if you're selling you know so yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's debates about the but i think that they've done a really good job of picking the channel partners they have now they've sort of handpicked those channel partners uh, a lot of them are veterans um they, so i think they they know how to grow a channel partner network but that's where i'd like to see the solution side kind of sit is more with the channel partners yeah okay okay yeah. Okay, so to like sum up what we spoke about today, so there is a digital transformation need for all the businesses, which is kind of a new thing. Yep. And this is a problem that businesses have to handle. Otherwise, they're going to go under Correct. because of competitors who are able to make real time decisions, right? Correct. Yep. So this is so basically, you could say that the industry in itself is in a 10, 15 year, like very big transformation shift, yeah correct yeah, yeah shift and basically palantir currently is the best solution on this but there is other competitors yep there's and other there's other methodologies you know like you think of think of palantir not just as a product and a platform but like a an ecosystem a philosophy yeah. a way you're going to do this and derive value and there are other competing philosophies among consultancies and erp providers so like there there are absolutely competing visions out there yeah. Exactly, exactly. And so basically Palantir's success will depend on their speed at penetrating the market. And can, can you see, for example, a version where let's say Snowflake would go to all the small companies and then those companies become big companies and they stay on Snowflake and then sort of they end up winning this, this race. And then yeah. Palantir would, I mean, because... I think that in this space, there is room for two, three companies. Those, the, those are the second and third order consequences of the decision to not take a bottom up sort of mass market SaaS approach, right? So like, yeah, that that's what you're sort of hinting at. And yeah, I mean, that could absolutely happen because everyone has is seeing these trends. I'm not the only person out there who sees these trends, right? Like 
Anyone yeah. who's tapped into the industry knows what's going on. They have the exact same information I do, you know? Yeah, and yeah. so they're making decisions and strategies at these companies to take advantage of the second and third order consequences of Palantir's decision to not go mass market. And they're doing it yeah. well, you know, they're not fucking around. And yeah, yeah. Um, I think that that's where the, the problems could come in is that the comp, I always just distill it down to the competition gets a vote. It doesn't matter yeah, what your yeah. strategy is. If you're not responding to what your competition is yeah, doing, yeah. And, and this is like SaaS 101, man. Like the idea that a, a competitor like Microsoft, who's done this over and over and over again, could just offer a shittier version of Foundry and through its network effects, kill you. Like that is Microsoft's goddamn MO over and over and over again. Just go read about it. That's history, you know? Yeah. yeah <laughs> so yeah. like, like, dude, the intelligent data platform from Microsoft is a direct competitor to Foundry, right? Yeah. They are taking the same lessons, the same terminology, cobbling together all of their shittier products to make a foundry like offering right so like they, they need that you can't operate in a bubble and just believe you're going to win because you're that good you you okay. have to and, address what the competition's doing and, and another question so if you're a big company and you have had foundry for five years you have thirty thousand employees that are all trained on foundry how easy yep. is it to say like okay here is microsoft which is a bit cheaper but shittier, but it's no problem. We would run on this. Like how easy it is to make the decision to change because it feels I, like it would be very hard. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't it's think that decision gets made. <laughs> it's like yeah. once you, once you pick one of these things, you're kind of stuck with it. And in, in this, if you're a 30,000 person company, not because of a technical problem, again, it gets back to change management. Like yeah, yeah. a 30,000 organization doing anything that big is going to, the, the real problem is the people, you know? Yeah, it's like, like what Musk says, that. you know, that the change has to be like 10x better. Yeah. Because otherwise yeah. it's not worth to... Exactly. Yeah. And with Palantir, okay. it is. It's definitely 10x better than the way they're operating today. In fact, I think that's the major selling point um, to get people on board. It's like, hey, you know that shitty ERP system you struggle with every day and you have to go to like five different systems to get <laughs> one answer. And by the time you go home, you're just like, do you want to cry? Yeah, we're going to fix that problem. Like you're going to get that answer in 30 seconds and you're going to love the experience. Like, and you're going to yeah, get to right. learn all these new skills that are going to upskill you in the workforce. And you're going to have promotion after promotion, raise after raise, or maybe go negotiate a better deal for people who are also using our software, which is also an awesome company over here. Like that's how you combat the change management problems. You just give people a vision of the future that gets them excited. You know? yeah, and Palantir yeah. can do that better than anyone. Right. So like Microsoft cannot do that. Microsoft's IDP platform, like if you really dig into it, doesn't get you excited. Like, oh, it's the same crappy software I'm using today. <laughs> Nothing about the Microsoft <laughs> gets me excited. <laughs> <laughs> so like, they absolutely have an ace in the hole when it comes to competing. But like, then again, I mean, we can just look at the history of how Microsoft put so many good products out of business and just made shitty versions of them. And, yeah, yeah. you know, but it's really because it was about the network effects they have, you know, and it's about the fact that they can use that and their distribution as a huge hammer, you know. Mm -hmm.